Warning, the following podcast contains irreverent humor, exceptionally nerdy opinions, potential cursing, and plenty of love for the prequels. If any of the preceding offends you, please turn off this podcast immediately, and may the Force be with you. Why, you stuck-up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder! You can't use that word! Only we can use that word! It's time for the Jedi to end. You're tuned in to the Nerf Herder Council, your source for Star Wars opinion, conversation, and debate, featuring your hosts, JT. I mean, they killed his mother. What's he supposed to do? Send him a postcard? I wish you wouldn't have done that. AJ. I'm on Facebook, man. Hit him all. Check me out. <laughs> Steve. Sir, you have a parasol on your face. <laughs> <laughs> please, really please was. do not tell me what I should and should not like, sir. Thank it you. It really was. On this episode of the Nerf Herder Council, we compare Revenge of the Sith to Rogue One. We know where both movies had to end, but which one provided a more satisfying journey to get there? Rogue One. Episode three. 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 Rogue one. You're wrong. This is. Nerf Herder Council. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Nerf Herder Council. I am your host, JT. With me is AJ and Steve. And uh, something we were talking about off air, I have to start it out with, AJ, since uh, you're one of my only friends that has a PS4 that would actually play online, you have to get that new Friday the 13th game, because it's awesome. And I'm awful at it, so you could probably kick my ass at it. Am I going to be any better than I am at Battlefront? Because we know how that goes. Probably not, but it is fun. Just start it's, off in some closed lobbies with like three or four of your friends first. That way you can just screw around with it and get yeah. used to the controls. And pretty, mu- you're pretty much expected to die in this game, right? I mean, it's oh, Friday yes. the 13th. So unless you're Jason, you're a victim. Yeah. Yeah. Because the longer the oh, ma- I can die. I'm good at dying. The longer the <laughs> matches goes, there's this little rage meter that fills up for Jason. And once it fills up, he's just completely OP and he's just going <laughs> to. He's just going to kill you by looking at that's you, not so. true. That is not true. And I know that because I was Jason, my second match ever, and my rage meter filled up and I didn't kill anybody. Yeah, well, that just means you <laughs> suck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over there just smashing buttons. <laughs> You're just breaking <laughs> windows and doors. <laughs> I did. I did learn, though, from from hearing people talking because they have their, their party chat on and everything. And I didn't I didn't have mine on because I don't know anybody. So whatever that they would be in a cabin and be like. Oh crap, here he comes. Here he comes. Oh my god, here he comes. And then I would go to the one door and start hacking it and then run to the front and do the other one. He's at the back. He's at the front. And then I would do the the stalk thing so they couldn't see me. Oh, I think he left. No, he's at the front. Oh. So it was kind of fun. It was like rats in a trap. It didn't get me anywhere, but at least it was fun. It was like being in a horror movie. It was really cool. Like you hear these people panicking cuz you're about to hack them to pieces. So I don't know. I'm kind of squeamish on that stuff. I, I played that demo of the Resident Evil game that you were telling me about. Yeah. Biohazard or whatever it's called. Yeah. Dude, just the demo was enough for me to be like, I, I don't want to play this game. This thing is it's like creepy. killing my piss. I get, <laughs> nice. I, I actually get sucked into that too. Like there was a couple Silent Hill games that were just, ooh, man. And I have uh, uh, Alien Isolation on PS4. And yeah, the, there fir- you go. the first Alien movie just really creeped me out. And this game totally has that vibe. So I, I play it. And especially if I if if I'm, you know, by myself in the dark, I'm just like, oh, my God, this is creepy with the surround sound and everything. Ooh, is it I, the uh, sense of isolation that does it? <laughs> it might be. It feels a little alien to me. <laughs> <laughs> so on to Star Wars topics. Uh, we have to start out this show, Steve, the way we yeah, did- let's talk about some games that we can win or at least one game we can win. I don't I don't think there is one like that, but <laughs> I, I believe that's what you're bringing up next. Oh, I thought you're talking video games. Yeah. But yeah, Steve, we have to start off this show the, the way we did the last one. And that is by talking about the Aluminum Falcons winning a Star Wars trivia contest, because since our last episode, we won another one. Yeah. Woo-hoo! That's three, and zero, right? Three, and zero. to the point where when I signed our team up, 
The guy taking the sign ups, the owner of the bar, an awesome dude named Sam at SideQuest over in Lakewood. Uh, he looked up. He said, "Boy, you guys just want to win everything, don't you?" <laughs> and I went, mm-hmm. "Yep, yes, yes I we do." do. Mm-hmm. You're starting to figure this out, man. Good job. <laughs> yep. So we got our little answer packet, and it was uh, AJ, myself, and uh, my wife Stephanie again, and it was specifically geared around episode four only. So we were expecting a lot more specific questions, a lot more difficult questions. Yeah. A lot of that B side stuff that oh, nobody yeah. should know. Yeah. yeah. Our thought was if, if covering, what was it? Uh, five movies, if covering five movies was that hard, imagine what they can come up with when they only have to focus on one movie. Yeah. And so all of us were watching or listening to episode four all throughout the day just trying to study to find any little nuggets we could possibly find. So, so you prep more for the trivia than you do our show. <laughs> Actually, yes. <laughs> but the, he but, totally begged it. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's more. There's more at stake oh, at, the, okay. at the trivia. Fair enough. Our pride is on the line. There, we have no pride on this show. So mm-hmm. uh, again, different. very true. <laughs> but yeah. So, so we're going through the first round and. They asked the first question, and I I always write the answers down because my handwriting is a little more legible than AJ's. And they asked the question. I looked at him like, "Mm," wrote it down. Asked a question. He looked at me. "Mm," wrote it down. It just bang, bang, bang. And we started realizing. We looked at each other, and even my wife looked at us and went, man, I thought it was going to be a lot harder than this. Maybe it's just the first round. This is pretty remedial. This is great. (laughs) Yeah. And so basically they told us that they had made it easier because they got complaints last time that it was too hard. And we went, oh, this ain't going to be good for everybody else. Yeah, right. <laughs> but there was a team that was like one point behind us. The, the first, Because it was the same way. It was eight rounds. So the fir- after the first three rounds, they give a score update. And after the next three rounds, they give a score update. And then they give the final score after the final two rounds. Well, after the, after the first three rounds, we were tied with a perfect score. And then after... The first six rounds, we were in the lead by a point. They had missed a question. We had a perfect score. And they went to announce. <laughs> and boy, this one this one lady was giving us shooting daggers at us from across <laughs> the room because they're kicking ass and they're like, they're reading the points. And these guys are missing one point and they're like, it's just in second place. She was pissed. <laughs> <laughs> you think we take this seriously? Yeah. Oh, they were not happy. Um, well, maybe they shouldn't have missed the damn question. Right. And so they get to the, they announce the finals and they're like in second place. They announce the other team and then they say, and you know, the winners, the aluminum Falcons with 65 out of a possible 65 points. <laughs> we got a perfect score. <laughs> it got to the point where I just looked at him. I'm like, dude, just, just tag me if you don't know one. Yeah. Actually, you know, what's funny. That is an excellent pun you just told because one of the ones I didn't know that AJ did. Oh, wow. I didn't even realize was oh, general tag. Yeah, go me. <laughs> it was the guy that, uh, that said, uh, you know, if, if the rebels have obtained a technical reader of the station, no matter whatever, you know, we are vulnerable. They wanted to know that guy's name. I'm like, you know, I've never known that AJ goes, Oh, it's general tag. I was like, okay. And you got the correct spelling. Nice. So I'd say there were about, Four of them that AJ knew that I wasn't sure of. And there was about two or three that I did. But and it was I mean, even my wife got some of these and she was like, what the hell? <laughs> like, so speaking we, of that night, I, I have to I have a bone to pick with you guys over that because you guys tweeted the score at some point during the night and said uh-huh. you were tied with the other team. So I replied to you with the greatest tweet I've ever had in my life. Uh, re- yeah. Referencing uh, the Holy Grail. Yes. I, I was like, tell them I fart in their general direction. <laughs> <laughs> their father smelt their, of elderberries. Their, their, their mother is a hamster. And their, their father, father smelt, smelt of elderberries. elderberries. <laughs> now go away. I shall taunt you a second time. <laughs> yes, that's I was, right. I was like, dude, I'm like, I've been sitting on this tweet for months and this thing finally fits <laughs> something I can use it on on Twitter. It's like not even that's an acknowledgement. I'm like, really? Wow. That's when you broke it out. Because <laughs> I haven't had a reason to fit it in anywhere else. <laughs> Look, there is always a reason for Monty Python and the Holy Grail quotes. So let me get this straight. Some people stockpile greeting cards waiting for the right opportunity. You stockpile tweets. Uh, just the one. I'm out now. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I, I'm done. I deleted my Twitter. I'm done now. That was that yep. was the peak. <laughs> <laughs> so it got so bad during this thing that after the fir- uh, after uh, how many times during the night did you go? 
Steve could have been doing this. We did that. We, yeah, we were like, we did. We we're like, man, this is one that they could actually help us with. Uh huh. It was, and the the funny part was like the the person taking the score sheets told me after one of the rounds that they had started using our answer sheets as the as the answer key. <laughs> Instead of going on the computer looking up their answers, they were just compa- they put ours on the left and then just went through everybody's and looked at ours like we were the teacher or something. And I was like, okay, well, this bodes well for us. I'm just glad we represented because every time we go in there, we talk to them about potentially doing a show, and it would really suck if we're like, yeah, we're we're such big nerds, we got the Star Wars podcast, and then we lose at trivia. Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, you, you better know your. Sh- you guys should have fun with it now because something tells me they're not going to let you sign up anymore. <laughs> Dude, well, and not for one of those, but the geeks who drink ones that we've done have been pretty close. Those, yeah, those were, are legit. Th- those were all like, you know, eighth round comebacks. But or the, the next time you sign up, they'll let you know, hey, this, this one's pretty <laughs> I, this one's I, pretty simple. You guys probably don't want it on this. <laughs> Two more things, and then we'll get to our topic for tonight. The first one is we uh, we did do a solid for our fellow Star Wars fans. We actually gave our prizes to the second place team. We 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 told them even if we won that we would let the second place team have the first place prizes, which was like a twenty five dollar gift certificate to the bar and something else and a lightsaber. And so we gave that up. So they gave us a ten dollar gift certificate to the bar, which was cool. Yeah, Steve, before you get too riled up, by the way, I checked out the lightsaber. It was just a regular Hasbro one. It wasn't like force FX or anything. Oh, good. Okay. If it was like black series or something, I'd be like, <laughs> Mine. You guys can I have the rest of it. I did the it, same but. thing. I was like, if that's one of those green Luke Skywalker <laughs> black series that I've been looking for for a couple of years, uh, they ain't getting nothing. We had the same look on our face because <laughs> I, I pitched the idea. I'm like, okay, look, man, maybe we should just be good sports about this. This is like after round three. I was like, yeah. maybe we should be good sports and just like not take the prize. And we both had this look in our eye like, well, let's find out what the yeah, prize let's see is. What it first. is first. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Stewie and Family Guy Star Wars. Mm, we'll get estimates yeah yeah get estimates <laughs> but the other thing and then we'll get to what we wanted to talk about tonight what are we, we winning we, uh, yeah. uh, uh, nah that's 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 crap just give it to the give it to those guys all you <laughs> it's like i had a neighbor who just moved out the other day and, and they were cleaning out their fridge and there was a a basket of free beer just sitting in the hallway saying like you know free we're cleaning out our fridge we don't want to take it with us I I actually looked at the beers before I decided to take them. <laughs> it's like, well, if it sucks, ooh, it's Great Lakes. Okay. <laughs> Unlike me, you'd just be like, yeah, that's free. It'll come in handy when I run out at the end of the night when people are over. Just give it to me. Well, if you if you ever want the raspberry twisted teas sitting in my fridge, you're welcome to them. Ooh, I like raspberry twisted tea. That's one of my favorites. But so, yeah, we heard the best team name you could possibly have, Steve. It was fantastic. <laughs> this this group of dudes <laughs> named their team. <laughs> if episode eight, this is literally their whole team name. If episode eight starts on an ice planet, we riot in the theater. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Oh, that is pretty nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the second place team was good. It was fear and loathing in most Eisley, which that was good, but I mean, nothing will touch. Nothing will touch that one. That's one of the greatest traditions of any trivia night in general is all the stupid team names that people come up with. Like, cause you know, they have to announce your name over the, over the speaker at least two or three times throughout the night. So no matter how brazen or, or you just crass it is, you're going to hear it. <laughs> like, yeah. You guys, you guys need to go to the party store and get some of those stupid glasses with the giant nose on it, like the mustache and stuff, <laughs> and, and change and change the team name for the next one and just show up wearing those <laughs> and see see who catches on to it. See, but I I can't change the team name though. My my ego is just too big at these contests. I'm like, no, I want the aluminum Falcons to be four and oh, five and oh, six and oh, seven and oh. I couldn't do it. You know, if we were any good at marketing, we would actually call ourselves the Nerf Herder Council. Yeah, uh, but no, oh well, but I had already started out one and oh, so I couldn't change it. <laughs> I just said that I couldn't possibly, but yeah, another, another good team name was Qui-Gon Jin and juice. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a good one too. But, uh, so anyways, uh, on to what we wanted to discuss tonight. You guys could call yourselves the dark Vaders. <laughs> good Lord. <laughs> I'd be like, we're the Chewbacca's. <laughs> We're the furry Wookies. So you got to have a cool name. It's like in fantasy football. You can't call yourself like the Cleveland Browns. The the Quigons. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> the Palpatines. They, annou- they announce you the <laughs> Palpatine. The, Palpatine. And they yeah, they Palpatine. say it correctly. And you got to go. No, no, no. Quee gods. Yes, we are the Quee gods. Quee gods. <laughs> Actually, can we just go and call ourselves the Oneaters? <laughs> and, <laughs> I'll, I'll send someone a, a best a Best Buy uh, gift card if they can email the show and tell me what that's from. Because yeah, that's, that's that's obscure right there. <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> so, but anyways, um, AJ and I actually were about to discuss tonight's topic last week when I realized, hey, we should save that for the show. And what Yet happened? Another conversation is ruined by having a podcast. No. Yet another podcast is made good by not having a conversation. Well, that's what I mean. Like every time we get on a top, we're like, no, 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 don't, don't yet. We, we're not on air. Stop it. Actually, that doesn't happen very much. What happens is we get in an hour and a half long conversation at the end go, damn it. That was, <laughs> that was a show topic we just wasted. <laughs> so this time I caught it before it got started. And I, I said to AJ, I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm putting this in my phone in case I forget. This is a show topic. So uh, we were debating. The merits of Rogue One and Episode Three, and we were debating which of them does a better job of telling a story we already knew the ending to. Episode Three, obviously, we know it's going to end with you know him turning into Darth Vader. Right. Rogue One, we knew was going to end with them getting the Death Star plans. So we were having a discussion about which one did a better job and I will start and I will say that my opinion um, was episode three. Now, that being said, I think my opinion on this is based on, you know, a couple different factors, but I will say that I think they both did an awesome job. Yeah, they're, they're equal to me, but I think that looking at things from a like logistic logistics perspective and just straight logically to me episode three did a better job and that's for me i think saying something because i think i finally realized that i think rogue one is my second favorite star wars movie second only to empire strikes back and it actually supplanted episode three on that list i just i I can't stop watching it and i'm like this is just so good i so i think it's you know number one is empire in terms of my favorite star wars movie number two is rogue one number three is episode three Wow, I I actually agree with all of that. You want to wrap it up? Yeah, sure. All right, great. Well, right. Uh, I was filibustering. Sorry, that was a quick show. Let's get on this Friday the thirteenth, guys. Right, here we go. <laughs> all right, let's go play. No, <laughs> no. Um, I had actually, um, I finally discovered this whole social media thing, and I decided to engage one of the uh, Facebook groups that we belong to, the Star Wars Podcast Alliance. Get some feedback on the topic, just so we had you know some more talking points tonight, and somebody else's opinion besides our own, because. We pretty much know usually where we're going to go with stuff. It's nice to hear what other people think for a change. Yeah. Um, hintity hint hint audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I actually expanded it a little bit from the initial premise. The, I mean, the whole reason we started this conversation was based on the fact that both movies had some similarities in in the job they were supposed to do. I mean, before the sale to Disney, episode three was supposed to be the lead in to episode four. And both stories as a result of being in that position had a predetermined end point. So I broadened it out to saying which one is the better movie. Cause all the points that we're discussing aren't specifically plot points, but they're more like the crafting of the films themselves. So you kind of got to step like more into like a film critics role and not so much in universe with it. In what context though? Well, like we were talking about, um, cause you always say that, the way the way they arrived at that predetermined endpoint of episode three was supremely satisfying. And, you know, I've been you know on the show said that it's kind of paint by numbers for me. It doesn't really swerve or do anything in a surprising way for me. Um, so that's that to me is more of a, a a film craft kind of question than an in universe thing. Like, did you believe that the Darth Vader? Th-? No, it it's more critiquing the making of the film than the film events themselves. So are we on the same page with what the topic is then? Yeah. Yeah. Um, But they brought up a whole variety of different perspectives. And this is the great thing is we got a pretty even split as far as who prefers which movie. Okay. Um, Like here's something that I I will absolutely give credit to. Um, Well, before before you get to the, the Facebook group, give your opinion on the topic and then let Steve give his that way we're on the table and then we can bring theirs into it. I think. 
Okay. Cause, okay. Cause it might be a good place to, to like, you know, jump off a jumping off point be where we start. So well, like you said that you, you thought it was a very satisfying um, journey from the beginning of revenge of the Sith to the end, to how they got to the end, knowing how it was going to end. Like all the things that you expected to happen happened. And to you, they were satisfying in how they played out. Yeah. Um, for me, I think rogue one does a better job um, because it w- it was pretty much a total surprise the whole way through. Like you knew that, I mean, it, you could even tell the general plot outline just by the whole thing. You you knew that based on the fact that there was a paragraph in episode four's crawl that says they've won their first major battle and they got the Death Star plans. You know, there's a battle and you know, they're getting the Death Star plans. See, I can already dispute. That's the, that's, so, that's great. So those two things were played out as expected. We, we got a battle and we got the Death Star plans in the hands of the rebels but how they did that and and the way the band came together and all the other things that led up to that, I thought was um, it was, it was just, it was more satisfying and we can debate why that was, but I just, I had more fun watching that story play out than I did watching revenge of the Sith play out. Okay. What about you, Steve? What Uh, would you say? I I'm kind of with you on it, John. I was fine with episode three. Uh, I know the crawl in a new hope gave us exactly what AJ said, but I never, I never sat down and went, wow, I need that. I need to see that to bridge this gap. Um, I'm glad they did it. Uh, Rogue One is obviously an amazing movie. Um, yeah, like I said, I even going into that movie, it was like, I kind of, it was an un, it was almost unnecessary to me to need that movie. But now that it's there, I am really glad that we do have, that to bridge everything kind of as a star Wars 3.5 almost. <laughs> right. You know, so, so yeah, it definitely, it definitely fits it and makes the story that much better than just the, uh, the cutoff point of episode three. So, so yeah, it's, I'm didn't want it. Didn't think I needed it, but totally glad it's there. Now that it's there though. Cool. See, and one of the things for me, uh, with AJ's point, uh, and, I'll be interested to get your opinion on this too, Steve. You said, AJ, that um, you thought the whole movie of Rogue One was a turn. There was twists and turns that you weren't expecting for the, you know, the entire length of the film. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, episode three kind of just went, you know, kind of linear, nothing really threw you. And I think that one of the reasons that I would say that episode three did a little bit better of a job was because it had a much harder time to get to the end because you already had five movies around it to know exactly what happened with all the characters. Whereas rogue one, all you had was the one line. They won their first major battle and they got the death star plants. They could do it. It was very gray. They could do what they they wanted as as long as they ended up with the death star plans at the end of the movie, they could pretty much do what they wanted. Exactly. Exactly. They, they, They didn't have all these other, plot points to tie in and work around whereas episode three did and it was it was such a and it's it, again it, maybe this comes back to why i like the movie so much and i've been on record as saying so many times that it just it to me it wasn't a paint by numbers thing and it was a daunting task to take these five movies and this final film episode three you know where it ends and they still made a great movie out of it and it wasn't just a, you know, he was, he was a jerk and now he's evil. I mean, there were other reasons for it and there was a lot of emotional stuff going on around it. And I liked that. So I think it had a much more difficult task ahead of it to get to that end point than Rogue One did. I do agree with that. There was so much stuff leading up to that movie that they were kind of penned in there. there I mean, how much can you swerve around when you've got that many plot points that you need to reach? You got, you have yeah, to keep so, con- continuity. So many characters you had to make Palpatine who he was. You had to have Obi-Wan do something and then disappear. You had to have Anakin turn into Vader. You had to kill Padme. You had, there's, you know, there's 20 characters that you had to do something with where rogue one, like you said, you had one gray area of the Death Star plans. You, yeah, you didn't you didn't even need a character in the movie, which obviously, you know, since they basically introduced nothing but new characters and then killed them all at yeah. the end. So now, I will say that that's one thing I think Rogue One did very well is that it did have a completely wide open canvas. And I think you make a great point, Steve, in that, you know, you don't really need that story. We know they got the Death Star plans. OK, moving on. But they did it in such a way where 
they brought these characters into the saga that you've never seen before. And I know you don't, you don't think this as much as I do, if at all, Steve, but I really got into the new characters. And I thought in the span of a two hour and 20 minute movie, they brought people in that I'd never seen before. And then they killed them off. And I was like, Oh, I mean, they did a phenomenal job with the characters. The story really was a lot different than you would think it would be. Again, right. I mean, that's one thing that the two movies have in common is that it, it you know, the end point, instead of going linear, a linear thing like, well, there are a bunch of rebels and here's their adventure to get the Death Star plans. Like, that's not what happened. Yeah. So that was cool. And, you know, I again, I, I just thought it was done so well when it was a story we didn't need. A lot of people probably didn't care about. But all of a sudden it's become probably the second best Star Wars movie there is. Yeah. I, I use the term a lot when I say throwaway characters. And that's pretty much it. Everybody was in Rogue One is somebody you just introduce and then dump them off. Right. But I'll tell you right now, they really, like you said, you know, within a span of two hours for characters that I can honestly say I didn't care that much about. You did feel for them at the end. Yeah. I, you know, when you can sit there and have feelings go through you because K2 just got killed. Yeah. Or, you know, that scene on the beach, you know, as much as you, you like, I, I, I was okay with Jin. I didn't really like the fake Han Solo. Like, <laughs> Cassie and Andor. Yeah, yeah, I really only saw him as a fake Han Solo the entire time, and that's why right. I just refer to him as that constantly. <laughs> but like, you know, that scene on the beach, you just sat there and you you really felt bad knowing what was coming for those yeah. two. So, yeah, I mean, like you said, in a span of two hours, when you can develop feelings for characters that you are upset that they're not going to escape at the end of the movie. Like we've been force fed through all eternity that the good guys always get away somehow at the end and yeah, basically killing off every single person that you saw in the movie. Yeah. It, it's it, it hits you differently. So it makes you feel bad for those characters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause part of you really wanted to see them just leave somehow and just go, Eh, whatever happened to him you know like they just disappeared yeah. off the face of the galaxy somewhere but you know killing him off made you actually feel pretty pretty bad at the end of the movie honestly yeah like they killed k2 i was like wow they killed one of the good guys but then the next one died which i believe was um uh wasn't it Bodie rook inside the shuttle yeah i think uh, i yes. think he was after that yeah. and i and i went what the hell is this like they are, they are killing good guys left and right. What's what's happening? Yeah, especially with uh, Saw. Yeah, because a yeah. lot. A well, lot, I guess technically Saw was the first death. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, a lot I was of just the, talking about the Rogue One crew, right? A lot of the uh, the build up to it was a lot of Jin and Saw. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of getting shoved down our throats, and to see Saw basically be in the movie for eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, he's like the Boba Fett of Rogue One. Yeah. <laughs> Like again, you kind of thought, you know, even though you saw the world collapsing around him, you still sat there and went, "There's, there's no way you're not going to kill that guy off that yeah. quick." Guy uh, and the building's gone. Okay, he's yeah. obviously dead. It, All right, never mind. It was so dire when you keep seeing good guys die. You're like, "What the heck?" Mm -hmm. And it always, it's, it's always so poignant to me. And I know it's like a very minor thing, but when Radis, Admiral Radis, is up in the ship and he's looking down as the Death Star mushroom cloud is like, you know, expanding over the plane, he says, "Rogue One, may the Force be with you." It's like, ah. Oh. Yeah, man, it's like it's just it's sad. It's it was very it, Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd ever seen a second of that show, I would understand that. But I will oh, take your word for it. They have no issues whatsoever with killing off major characters at random times during the series. Like yeah, a nobody's safe. Yeah, a normal TV series. You always have like some some big stuff at the beginning and then it goes into cruise control and then you have some major stuff at the <laughs> Walking end. Dead. Yeah. Like you, you know, Rick and Daryl are, are like permanently safe basically. But yeah. You'll, you'll right. be in the middle of that cruise control in the middle of game of Thrones in episode seven. And then they'll just kill some major character out of the blue. Like what the, f what, <laughs> <laughs> why are you doing this right now? <laughs> nice edit avoidance, by the way. I try to, I'm the, I'm the one that's got to do it. So I try to edit myself. <laughs> No I'm trying to edit myself first and foremost here no wonder instead you of cut doing the, it later. <laughs> no wonder you cut the least. All right. So so that's one of the criteria that I was thinking of, actually, is okay. character deaths. Like, you, you consider who dies in episode three. Uh, right off the bat, Dooku. Yeah. Okay. Dooku was the main villain of episode two. So it's basically like you only got one movie with him because he was introduced later in episode two. And then he dies so early in episode three. It's less than a film's worth. Right? Yeah. Did you care? 
I thought it was so sudden that like the guy who was putting up a fight against Yoda went out that easily at the beginning of three. Well, when I first saw it, my take was, okay, Anakin is obviously more powerful. That's, that's the way that I saw it. Well, yeah, that's, that's what you're supposed to get out of it. I, I just don't see how either Anakin, it, it was such a jump to see that Anakin had either grown that much in power or Dooku had diminished that much in power. It's, it's like in a pro wrestling storyline, you know, where like a dude is like mopping the floor with everybody. One finisher drops everyone. And then all of a sudden he gets like, he loses a title with like a small package or something, you know, or an insiguri. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's an insiguri to me anyway. Yeah. Like you lose on like a roll up or something, you know, like some chump moved, like drops yeah. him. You're like, well, what, what the hell? You were just indestructible. Like last week. Yeah. yeah. Bushwhacker Luke hip toss puts him down for the three count. <laughs> right. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So like the fact that Dooku. Scotty too hottie worm. <laughs> <laughs> so Dooku goes out that fast and I'm like, oh, okay. I get that. That Anakin's supposed to be super powerful, but I don't really care that Dooku just died. Yeah. Uh, in answer or, to your or, question. Or it's, or it's like Pirates of the Caribbean where, um, the, the Kraken takes out Sparrow at the end of two, and then it's just killed between the events of two and three. Like that was the big, that was, that was the big phantom that they were running away from in two. And then he's voluntarily dead by the time the third one even begins. Like, what the heck is that? Yeah. Uh, in answer to your question, no, did not care whatsoever that Dooku went out that quick in episode three. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess you make a good point, but I think, I and think, then Grievous. Yeah. Grievous, I mean, yes, Grievous was technically introduced in the Gendy series between the release of episode two and three, but how many people saw that? Yeah. Compared yeah. to the general movie going audience that, that only exactly. saw the movies. So let's basically consider, especially cinema, cinematically, it was Grievous's debut. And he went out like less than halfway through the movie. So you killed your villain from the last movie very early on. Then you killed the new villain very early on. Did not care. You didn't have enough time to get invested in these characters to care when they died. Well, they're bad guys. Are we really going to give a damn? No one's going to be Darth Vader. I mean, let's be honest. Does, does anybody No, but it should have been it should have been a bigger deal. You should have felt like it was a a harder fought victory for the for the good guys. Eh, I don't know. To come that early in the movie. Um, it came right away for Dooku. So that's it's not dramatic because it's right at the beginning. And for Grievous, he wasn't established enough to have obi-wan's victory over him feel like it was a big accomplishment yeah i mean i think i think maybe had they left that deleted scene in episode three where he captures and murders shock t right in front of obi-wan and anakin i think that might have established a little more yeah gravitas to the grievous character because you're like okay this guy can this guy can actually slaughter a jedi like that's pretty important yeah, even yeah even with the minimal amount of screen time that would have given you the hatred yeah. That you wanted in that character to and it makes him a threat to, yeah to yeah. root obi-wan on you know as he kills grievous is so you know it's like that yeah it would have given you a little more vested interest in watching that character go away yeah yeah one of the points raised in the facebook conversation was that the clone wars series you know the subsequent one the cg one with dave mm -hmm. filoni uh that's when you got all the screen time with grievous to build him up so when you see him in three you know retroactively having been informed by the tv show then you're like okay now i get why this battle is so big yeah you yeah. got the you got that exact backstory you wanted of all oh, the all the lightsaber hilts are from jedi that he slaughtered and the whole giant mm -hmm. thing where yeah if you would have just had him kill one jedi on screen it probably would have accomplished the same amount of work yeah in, I, in the eyes of a fan I, th I think for me with the dooku and grievous thing <sighs> It's it's hard for me to to judge objectively because first of all, you know that Anakin is going to end up with Palpatine. So you know Dooku's gone at some point anyway. So I was like, okay, and the way they did it, as I said, I just think it made it look like, you know, Anakin grew more powerful. And with Grievous, after that I'm like, well, if if a if a Sith Lord isn't gonna be a able to Sith Lord <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> but yeah if a if a sith lord um you know can't overtake them well how the hell is a droid gonna overtake them so i i expected that eventually grievous was gonna be cannon fodder because he was lesser of of an opponent 
than True. Dooku was. So I, I kind of assumed that was going to happen. So it wasn't that big of a surprise. Yeah, I never really bought into his threat to begin with. I thought he was a really cool character. I'm glad I'm glad that they um expounded upon that character in the Clone Wars because I, I really like that character. When I first saw episode three and I'm like, oh, this is cool. I thought it was kick ass. I, I had a lot of fun with it. I I, I was it. I was confused because going into episode three, I knew it was the last one. I'm like, why are you giving me a new villain in this? Why why aren't we just using Dooku through this thing? Like if you're gonna build him up as, oh my god, he was a Jedi turned traitor and he can fight with Yoda and hold his own. I was like, okay, that's the guy who should have been anchoring this thing. But no, he he goes out like a chump in like the first 20 minutes of the movie. I, so so I you're saying that, that, that the uh, General Grievous to episode three is Krennic to Rogue One because Krennic was, a, why, why couldn't they just have Grand Moff Tarkin as the bad guy? I mean, you, you don't have to off him. You can't, obviously, but he was already established like Dooku was in episode two. So why not just have, you know, Dooku, you know, you want him throughout episode three, but. They introduced Grievous, which is they introduced uh, uh, Krennic in Rogue One. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah, I can. Kind yeah, of, I can kind of see where AJ is coming from. Grievous could have easily been a Clone Wars bad guy that stretched multiple seasons instead of just showing him up in the middle of episode three and killing him off three quarters of the way through episode three. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have my questions about Krennic. I mean, the same way you have questions about Grievous. I mean, Krennic to me, it always seemed like, like Tarkin just thought he was a dumb a hole. You know, he just yeah. Well, you you effed everything up, but then but then Tarkin goes and blows up their whole entire freaking city. It's like at the end of the movie, he's like, "Oh, that's all of our stuff. Nuke it." Like, what the hell? the The reason I didn't have a problem with Krennic was because they had that first scene where he shows up at an earlier point in the timeline and says. Well, first he he, you know, lies through his teeth, plays along. He just he had a great intro to like establish his character, and then the movie picks up ten years later, and that guy is still running the show. So you're like, okay, he's clearly got a, a you know career behind him, and he's somewhat competent. Okay, I see. One thing I do wonder, and I know you don't have this background, Steve. I wonder if my opinion of that kind of stuff was um, tainted in any way by having read Catalyst before seeing Rogue One. So I knew the backstory. Well, tainted usually means a negative connotation. Are you saying like, yeah, Rogue One was was hindered? Like you you liked Krennic less because you knew more about him before you went into the movie? Yeah, yeah. I well, I, no, just the, not the movie itself, just the character because the way he's portrayed, at least in my view, in Catalyst, he was he just seemed like a a lot bigger of a deal. And in again in Rogue One it kind of seemed like he was just like a puppet for Tarkin and just, they thought he was like an idiot. Oh, yeah. I, I thought it was pretty consistent throughout. I mean, Steve, did you get the impression from the movie? What was your impression of Krennic's uh, competence from the movie? Uh, it seemed like he had his crap together. You know, he, he's the guy that had spearheaded the entire operation. And, yeah. You know, Tarkin just kind of took it from him at the end and went, oh, yeah, that's a great space station I just built. Thanks. Yeah, see, that's what I didn't <laughs> understand. Like, he, he blows up Jetta City because he's, kill, you know, he's he's sending a message to the galaxy. He's, you know, eliminating Saw Gerrera's rebels and all that. And instead, Tarkin's like, well, you're a tool. Like, well, what the hell? Yeah, it was it was kind of like, hey, test that out. And if it sucks, you know, you can go ahead and keep it, Krennic, but it worked. So Tarkin was like, all right, well, I'll go tell Palpatine, you know, about what I just built. Uh, yeah. Thanks. thanks, dummy. Go sit down somewhere. <laughs> <Right>? You <laughs> schmuck. Hey, Imperial backstabbing. Tarkin, you know, built his reputation on the backs of his comp competition, basically. No, I actually thought that Krennic was good because, and this is maybe going a little too far, but I'm pretty sure this is the kind of decision making that goes into character design. As soon as I saw the cape on that dude, I'm like, I know you're ah, AJ's obsessing about capes again. Oh, my God. No, but really, like, you, we've never seen an Imperial wearing a cape before. I'm like, how ostentatious is that? Like Vader it, had a cape. He's not an Imperial officer. He's he's a Sith Lord. <laughs> but for a military guy to wear a cape over his military uniform, I'm like, he clearly he's he's in it for the show. Like he's, yeah. he's got a lot of bluster. Yeah. The ego. So I totally, as, as soon as it came out that like, you know, maybe he was kind of in over his head at times and, 
you know, he, he has his audience with Vader and he's talking about, wait, so I'm still in charge. Like he, he, that, that, that's what he cared about. He cared about making sure that he got recognition. He was so obsessed with being recognized for what he did instead of just getting the job done and letting the action speak for themselves. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. It's a good point. So I thought, I thought Krennic was fine. I didn't have any problems with him whatsoever. I thought that was, and in the book, it's the same way, Steve, where he's always like on the verge of failure and always finding a way to pin it on somebody else. Yeah. So I, I thought it was pretty consistent throughout and, and it makes sense that it would be because in this new era, all these stories are being conceived of at the same time. So yeah. there really shouldn't be any disconnect like there was in the past. Yeah. Well, you said that in the, in the Facebook discussion on that group, that there were some good points. So I know you wanted to get to that. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the first one that came across, uh, from a guy named Adam Palmer and yes, I'm going to call him out by name. Just give him props. Cause no, that's fine. They helped. Yeah. Um, coincidentally the, the, the First two guys, well, three technically, if you count me, the poster, uh, were all named Adam. So anyway, uh, you bunch of smarty pants, Adams. Right? <laughs> so so Adam Palmer said that uh, Revenge of the Sith was a more complex and much larger story. True, we we agree yep. on that. Like, yeah. there's way it's basically more a different way to phrase my point, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the telling could have been more nuanced. And see, that's what I'm. That's kind of where I'm coming from. Is I'm like, all right, you knew you had to get to this point. Oh, and they did, and you had to get to this point. Oh, and they did, and it wasn't there was nothing that happened along the way except for maybe, maybe the deaths of Dooku and Grievous. And we knew they had to die, but I thought that maybe they could have done it later in the movie. So the fact that they went out so soon was kind of surprising. Okay. I could see that. Maybe maybe they just tried to cram too many plot points into one movie. And that's, and that's what the conversation kind of swerved into here was we all kind of agreed on the Facebook thread that there was enough plot there for, at least two movies in itself. Yeah. I think, I, I think when you, Steve, when you broke it down to, you know, to say, well, you gotta, he has to turn to Vader. You gotta kill Padme. You gotta get rid of Dooku. You gotta get rid of Grievous. You know, you gotta, you know, Yoda's gotta and, go into exile. Like and, that's a lot of pretty major t- stuff. Yeah. And at the time, this was the last movie we were making. So you had to, you know, you had 20 pounds of crap to put in a five pound bag. And, yeah. and you had, <laughs> At the time, you had nowhere else. I love that thing. You had nowhere else to stuff that stuff because you know the TV shows weren't. Well, they might have been getting spoken of by then, but maybe not. I don't know. Now, Clone Wars uh, hadn't started you know, yet. Nope. Having having other movies, you know, come along, you know, in between three and four or wherever else they're gonna stick all these other uh, anthology movies, which I will always call them that i don't care what hey, the hell fine. disney wants to call them that's anymore fine. screw your stupid star wars hey, we, stories. we also anthologies we, damn it we also <laughs> still call it episode seven and episode eight even though they're like no it's it's the force awakens and the last jedi like no it's not exactly good. so yeah it's like they they had so much they had to fill and they went crap we have 90 minutes left in this entire saga and we have to f- put six hours worth of stuff in here yeah see i never noticed it i think i think that's one thing is in certain movies like you can kind of you know they they talk about movies where it moves too quickly and it didn't feel that way in episode three to me and i don't know if that's because i knew all that stuff was going to happen and maybe i was just so excited to see how it played out but i never felt like they were shoehorning in plot points just to get it done i i actually read reviews that that said well, why didn't we see how, you know, Chewbacca met up with Han Solo? We saw these other things and people actually, there were people asking for more stuff in there. I'm like, oh my God, how much more are you going to put in there? Right. But I, I, I didn't think that it was just shoehorning these plot points in for the sake of getting it out of the way. It actually still served the story to me. Yeah. There were, there was a couple bits of fan service. Like we didn't. I forget. Actually, we've seen too many behind the scenes and deleted scene stuff. Now I'm trying to remember. <laughs> right. Did we actually... No, it was a deleted scene that showed Yoda's pod landing on Dagobah. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay, was. it was going to be in there, and they cut it out. And thank mm-hmm. you, because you don't have to have like quite that completion of the dots. That was you that, know? and that was actually, if you listen to the commentary on that scene, that was their exact explanation. Was Rick McCallum said he wished he would have left it that they would have left it because it was such a beautiful scene and all this. Um, but the reason that they, what are you doing? Uh, computer's crapping out over. Here. Okay, as long as it's not our our recording no. um but yeah he said it was such a beautiful scene but he said that you know they ultimately took it out because george lucas said well we already know where he ends up you don't certain things you don't have to show him if it's that obvious mm-hmm. you know he ends up on dagobah in seclusion so once he gets into that pod and just just to look on his face when he gets in the pod you know he's out 
You know, something bad's going to happen. And even though he goes back to Coruscant and he has the fight and stuff like that, all they have to say is he jumps in the air car with uh, 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 Bail Organa and he says, into exile, I must go. There you go. There's your answer. Yep. Good enough. So they explained it in one sentence. You don't have to have a whole nother scene of exposition. Yeah. And there was a lot of, well, Return of the King didn't quite do this because it didn't have to lead into anything else. But I always compare Revenge of the Sith and Return of the King. Because they both have this kind of like, it feels like so much of the the back half of that movie is just jumping from one plot thread to another to close it. Just just tie this up, tie this up, tie this up, yeah. tie this up. And that's a lot of what Revenge of the Sith ended up doing too was, you know, once the lightsaber duel is done and okay, well, let's show Luke being dropped off at the homestead and let's show Padme's funeral and let's show Tarkin and Vader and the emperor on board, the star destroyer looking at the, the shell of the death star and, 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 and like just constant little like things being wrapped up. And well, at least, and that's always been a complaint of my of mine for the movie is, you know, you got a 20 year gap, but everybody's really in place at the end of revenge of the Sith to just jump right to where they need to be for episode four. It's like you had two decades to get there. Well, but in, in defense of that, don't forget that was supposed to be the last Star Wars movie. Yeah. So if if he if he would have left it open, the amount of bitching that people were already doing about the prequels, could you imagine what they would have done if he would have just had it stop and not answer all those questions? To to his thinking, he he was closing those loops. That's a fun thought experiment though because I get why for fan service you might want to put that in, but part of what's so great about star Wars is the stuff that's left unanswered. And I think it's perfectly plausible to tie up some of them and just leave others and be like, you know what? There could be stories told about those, but they're not important enough. We don't have to see Luke being delivered to the homestead. And like those sorts of moments, they could have just, uh, they were understood anyway. I, I always play both sides of the fence too much on this stuff, but you already brought up the Chewbacca thing. So people are already complaining about stories that weren't, told so john's kind of right in the fact that yeah sorry that if they opened you know they already left enough open holes you know say they left four or five you know for people to complain about what if you would have left open another six or seven you know people would have lost their damn minds over it that we're done with star wars now and there's too much too many open ends and and people would have just like you said people would have just been whining and crap in their pants the entire time over well, why wasn't this told and why why didn't we see where luke was dropped off and how come yoda's not blah blah blah, blah. Like, yeah like even though you said you know it's insinuated people still would bitch about it because oh well, we didn't see luke get dropped off so he could yeah. have been somewhere else and and something else could have happened and this and this and maybe he got to tashi station and didn't <laughs> crap, crap his pants over some droids and, yeah right <laughs> do, you, do you think that was kind of like a a, res- a reaction that George had to the fans was tying up all that stuff just so no one could speculate or complain that he left it out or anything. He's like, okay, fine. You want to know everything? Here's everything. There are probably no, there's probably. no room for any any sort of interpretation. Yeah, he was probably abs- he was absolutely at that point. You know, with yeah. all the bitching about the the two previous prequels. Yeah, and, yeah. And when Episode Three came out, he probably said, eh, "F all of you here. Yeah, here. It's just going to be ninety minutes of of." drop cuts just just quick edits all the way <laughs> right? across the star wars universe and here's every single story told yeah. wash my hands done go screw i'm going yeah, ex- home <laughs> exactly and you know, I, you know what's weird if you think about it rogue one kind of i mean not for the same reasons but rogue one ended the same way they didn't just say okay we got the plans and a few of the route like let's say you know bays and cheered imway made it out or something like that they killed everybody it's a dead end they got the Death Star yep. plans, and that movie you can't do nothing else. Yep. So they it basically very did black the same and white thing. in a big gray area of Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they basically did the same thing, and I mean, and yeah, I mean, it, from a storytelling standpoint, the reasoning is is because it, you you want it to be like this dire mission that you know they just barely squeak by by the skin of their teeth, and I understand that, but it's also. I mean, at some point you have to wonder if it's in the back of their minds. If you leave a couple of those people alive, people, they know that people are going to go, well, okay, why am I not seeing Bays and Chirrut and all this stuff? 
where were they if they if they were the ones that got the Death Star plans? Why aren't they all of a sudden mem- members of the Rebel Alliance? Every time you write a prequel and you throw something unique in it, people want to know why it wasn't there. Yeah, in this, yeah, and that's and, you know, and they went bitch. scorched earth. And there where, are, where are the Death Troopers? Where are the U wings? Yeah. Where are the Tusk Strikers? Say, people, yeah. are, people are already doing it. How come when I watch Episode Four, nobody brought up Sherrod Emway? How come his name was never floating around before? Yeah. And, 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 I mean, and that that goes back to our point of of suspending disbelief from the last show. But yeah, I mean, they they kind of went the same way that uh, episode three did scorched earth at the end. Like yeah. there and you're done. And, and we've you know? spoken on this a few times, you know, since we started this podcast that it, the universe that is Star Wars, eh, not in universe, but the real world here, it you lose all the time. No matter what yeah. people are going, it, they're going to find the most minute things it's almost like uh it's almost like politics where and the way our stupid president is right now he could just turn out to be the world's greatest president ever in the history of the united states and and people are still going nitpick the smallest little thing so that's how star wars is just you're never going to make people happy when it's all said and done yeah if they do the scorched earth thing, they're going to go, well, oh man, you should have left that open. It's, yep. And then the next movie they'll leave open and go, well, why didn't you guys just close it, it off? It, yeah. Why is there no, mm-hmm. why, why didn't you close that one off? It's, that's why that's the exact reason why George said, screw it and sold the damn thing off. <laughs> yeah. It's like, a, I've, I've seen the comment many times. He threw a bunch of crap at Kathleen Kennedy and went here. Yeah. <laughs> just, you, you take I'm it. I'm done with this. And Hot you just potato grab, with it. You just grab like a small box of crap out of his office and went, I don't even want the rest of it. I'm gone. Just, <laughs> right? This is yours now. You you have fun with this. I'm leaving. <laughs> yep. Well, I've, I've seen the comment online so many times where, you know, people have said that, you know, Star Wars fans aren't happy unless they're complaining about something. And if, yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, I mean, yep. you could make that argument. So I can't blame them, but, uh, you know, so what are, what are some of the arguments uh, in favor of Rogue One, AJ? Well, that was one of the ones in favor of Rogue One was that uh, it was a more fun oh, okay. story. Okay. Um, he said it was it was just a fun movie that tells a pretty simple but cool story. And uh, for that reason, he thinks Rogue One is the, the better film. Okay. And in a vacuum, I think he's probably right. I, I said that I, at the it was outset, designed, so I It think was designed I, to be its own separate thing, so that yeah. makes sense. Um, but that is, when he said fun, that really like keyed into me. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I think that's part of the reason why it feels like such a better lead in to a new hope than episode three ever did. Episode three got the, the stories and the plot to where it needed to be, but vibe wise, and you've done this JT watching and Steve, I don't know if you've done a marathon where you've just like plowed straight through one to six, but jumping from three to four, Holy crap. The tone is so different. Yeah, it is because episode three is such an emotionally dense movie. Like there is no humor. There's no brevity. It's just dark to darker to darkest. Yeah. And then you get episode four and you get, you know, whiny Luke and droids bantering around and, and, you know, haha jokes and, you know, Jawas and all this craziness. Rogue one, I think did a great job of telling like a dire, uh, you know, do or die kind of situ- or do and die kind yeah. of situation, <laughs> yeah. but it was still, it still had jokes in it. It was still funny. It had more of the brevity that the original trilogy had that by the end of the prequels was gone. Would you say it was a perfect mix of episode three and episode four then in that respect? Cause it kind of has both elements from what you're saying. I, I think that would make sense. Yeah. It definitely introduced more of the, the gray areas of storytelling that came in after the original trilogy was made. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was back in a time where there were good guys and bad guys and that was it. And you know, as the storytelling went on and especially star Wars went on, the, the good guys had more, you know, gray about them and the bad guys had better motivations and, you know, so it was more nuanced storytelling, but that's just the way storytelling is gone. Uh, but yeah, the, I mean, K2SO is a perfect example of like fitting right in. And that's the thing we talked about this. These, you could drop these characters into the universe and they all fit and the banter fits, even though they're completely new and some would say extraneous additions to the franchise. Yeah. I mean, you could make the extraneous argument. I just, man, I, you know, I've, you know, you know, my feelings on Bays and Cheered. I love them. And I, I keep, I keep waiting for like a novel to come out and the only one is that guardian of the wills and it's a young adult novel, which supposedly is like, is you can read it as if you're an adult and it's, it's fine. But I, I read an excerpt and it just, it was a little too, maybe it's just the, the writer's style. I wasn't quite into, it wasn't like Timothy Zahn where mm. it seems like a regular 
you know, like a like a real world novel, but it's just set with Star Wars characters and locations and stuff like that. So but, I'm entertained by it more to see like how it expands the mythology than the writing style. But you're right. It's it doesn't read. It doesn't read like the best of Star Wars fiction. That's for yeah. sure. I, I, I wish I could put my finger on what the hell it is about cheered in way that I love so much. But every time he's in that movie, I'm like, man, this guy's awesome. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 the fanboy in you. You hated him so much going into that movie that that's probably why you love him so much now because you got that that respect for the character that you you like double over because you almost feel bad about <laughs> overcompensating hate, yeah about hating on him so much before the movie started yeah what what's a blind guy with a stick gonna do <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know man but it's just like I something about that character just resonates with me so much. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it, I mean, from the first time I saw it, I mean, I, I said, I walked out of the theater. I'm like, that guy was awesome. And everyone's like, what the hell? You hated that guy. I'm like, I know. Believe me, I'm I'm more surprised than anybody he, else. Like, he was, I really expected that character to suck. And it was, was my favorite. He was a great character the moment they put the burlap sack on his head. Oh, yeah. that was great. Yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm blind. I was like, that is awesome. I say he was a great character from that moment forward. Yeah. I did. Man, it was. Maybe it's just because I, I'm such a big fan of like force driven stories and he was he's just like an, an embodiment of, you know, believing in the force and the ultimate good guy type of thing, you know, because he, he almost seemed like a Captain America esque character to me. And Captain America is my favorite Marvel character. So because mm. he, he didn't really have superpowers, but he's still like a hero and he does extraordinary things just based on being that good and you know, a belief in something. And it, 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 there, there are character simul- similarities if you look at it. And so maybe, maybe that was it. I don't know, but I, I love cheered in I'm, I'm still surprised by it. Every time I watch it, I was like, man, oh man, I, I went back and listened to our episodes with me crushing that. And I was like, boy, was I wrong? <laughs> Holy crap. So, well, uh, that's a, that's a thing right there. And back to the crafting of the movie, like we were talking about, I, I you were pleasantly surprised by cheer it. You know, you walked in and you were completely surprised by how much you liked this new thing. Yeah. Was there anything in episode three that you were like surprised by that you had um, one opinion going into the theater and then had a totally different opinion coming out? I don't think that there was, I mean, I, I knew where the story was going to end. I knew that I loved the previous two movies. So I expected to love this one. Um, Man, I thinking back, I, I don't I mean, I didn't look up spoilers or anything, so it wasn't like I went into the theater knowing, you know, the specific plot points of it. But I don't I don't I don't think that there was, I, you know, well, no, I take that back. I I knew what was going to happen. And yet I, I was surprised by the fact that. The whole time you could see him kind of, you know, during when Mace Windu is fighting Palpatine and stuff and you know, you could see him all of a sudden it's happening. I w I was really surprised at how much I was sitting in my seat going, no, don't turn, don't turn, don't turn. Come on. Oh, like it was killing me. I'm like, Oh, like, I yeah, just, they, they did a good job of keeping him right on the edge Yeah, for the entire thing. Even though you knew it was going to happen, it, it still, it still almost made you believe well, and th- yeah, that it wasn't going to happen or even, something. Even the scene with where he's ki- with, when he kills the younglings and everyone points to that as okay, that's a bunch of crap. But no one ever points out the fact that he's crying in that scene. He knows what he has to do and he doesn't want to do it, but he has to do it in his own twisted logic. So he's if he wants to save Padme, he's got to kill a crap load of little kids. He doesn't want to do it. And but and no one points that out that he's not just in there like with this evil look on his face. Okay, then I'm gonna chop kids' heads off. No, he's crying because he knows what he's about to do. He knows it's wrong, but he has to do it. And I, to me, that is such a, a a a missed point when people argue about that movie. That it to me is so huge. You know, going and killing the Nymoidian leaders and stuff on Mustafar is one thing. You know, getting yeah, they in, were already enemies anyway. Yeah, getting into it with Obi Wan. Okay, he thought he thought Obi Wan, you know, turned Padme against him, so he's a mortal enemy now. But to go kill little kids in order to save your wife—I mean, what kind of moral dilemma does that put you in? And he's crying in the scene, and no one ever points it out. So, I mean, but I mean, that's kind of getting off topic. But I mean, yeah, I I just think I was really surprised at how 
invested I was in the, oh man, I can't believe he's turning. Like it was really sad to me. And honestly, I still get that feeling to this day. I watched the movie and as soon as, as soon as they split up about 45 minutes into the movie, Obi-Wan and Anakin, and he, and he says, goodbye, old friend. May the force be with you. He's like, and may the force be with you. I'm sitting there like, ah, now it starts. And I'm just sitting there like, oh man, like you just wish you could change the story somehow and have him like, you know, just put a lightsaber through Palpatine's face instead of cutting off Mace Windu's hands. Like what would happen? You know, mm-hmm. like I, and I still find myself doing that. And I think that's why I love the movie so much is because I still have that visceral emotional reaction to it the same way I did the first time, which I never expected to have. I mean, it, it, when you know something's going to happen beyond a shadow of a doubt, and it still makes you go, oh, man, don't let that happen. You know, it's like the end of Marley and me. I know the dog's going to die. But I'm still like, no, maybe the dog can live this time. Like, maybe he's the world's oldest dog. Let's be 50. And it's a happy <laughs> ending, you know? And it, sure, of course. Like, the, the dog goes to the vet. He's got stomach bloat. And they, they repair him. And all of a sudden, he's running around in the yard. And the movie ends with a big thing on the screen that says, Marley was 12 years old at this point. He lived another 38 years and set the Guinness Book of World Records for the oldest dog ever. <laughs> and like, oh, see, okay, that's cool. I didn't have to see him die. I knew that he lived the longest life ever. That's awesome. It's like back in the day that <clears throat> I knew all the time. I probably even did it a couple of times where you would watch movies up to a certain point because you knew <laughs> You're like, oh, the first half of this movie is excellent. And then it would hit that point, like you said, where Obi-Wan and Anakin split. and You just turn it off. You're like, okay, that's cool. Like, I'm going to watch something on Netflix now. <laughs> it's, like, it's like I watched I Am Legend for the first time the other day, and I made my wife tell me when the dog got it. And I just, I'm just like, I went out of the room. And I'm like, tell me what to come back in. And she did. So when I left the room, the dog had gotten injured. <clears throat> And for all I know, Doggy went to the vet and he couldn't afford the bill. So he, she got adopted by a nice little family, you know, that lived in a, on a farm. Sure. And I come back in happened. the room. I come back in the room and the dog's gone. And, you know, no harm, no foul. Very, I didn't know what happened. Very off topic for a Star Wars podcast. But, yeah, I saw that movie in the theaters and that whole moment of that once the dog got injured. I just remember sitting there the whole time going. No, like you're not going to. Why would you do this to the dog? Like, yeah. Why are you going to do that? He's to, he's dying. He's dying right yeah. now in his arms. This is great. Like we're yeah. watching this right yep. now. <laughs> like 15 minutes worth of basically being aggravated at the movie. Yep. <laughs> I thought the movie wasn't nearly as good after that happened. Not because the dog was <laughs> exactly. gone, but, but it was it just changed the vibe of the movie. And it, we'll get back on Star Wars. Like it changed the vibe of the movie for me. And I thought the vibe was so cool with it, with it being just the two of them in the beginning. But had I seen that in the theater? And that had happened, I would have hated the second half because I'd have been sitting there like, you don't have to show that. I mean, <laughs> you don't. I don't need to see that crap. Just have the dog get hurt, have him be crying, and then all of a sudden have him standing over a little grave and like, oh, the doggy died. You don't got to show what happened. I mean, I heard what? He choked out the dog or something? Like in, a, in an arm bar or something, he chokes yeah, out the he dog break, while he's sobbing. I'm like, his, what the hell? Breaks his neck or chokes him yeah, or something. I'm like, you I don't, don't need that. I mean, I have a hard enough time in the beginning of Jaws when there's a lab running up and down the beach and everyone's like, is there a shark? And all of a sudden the lab's gone. I'm like, you don't need that. Leave the dog alone. Let a kid get eaten. Damn it. I'm like you can kill a four year old, but not a dog. Like, what did that dog way, do to anybody? Just, you just see two little bloody feet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so morbid. People are like, oh, my God, you are a bastard. <laughs> it's like I have a harder time watching dogs die than people. I, I just I can't do it. I'm one of those. If I know a movie has animal violence, I'm like, nope. Yeah, that's why I hated the Amityville Horror. Same reason. Yeah, the only I, the only death is the dog. Yep, I couldn't stand that. I almost walked out of the theater. But so, anyways, back to the point. AJ, go back to the Facebook. So Star group. Wars. So yeah, yeah. Star Wars. <laughs> so okay, so here's a point in favor of Revenge of the Sith. Okay. Uh, they say that it's a better structured story. They say that Rogue One bounces around too much and lacks a clear cause and effect from beat to beat. Yeah, I, I could see that. It's kind of, I mean, that's one of the complaints that some people have had is that I, I and, and if I'm understanding him correctly, is that some people have said, well, how are they all this group of scoundrels? And then an hour later, they're all fighting for the cause. You know, it's mm. so, I mean, I, I guess I could kind of see that. But then again, in defense of it, again, it's a two hour and 15 minute movie. What are you going to do? Yeah. You don't, you don't really have the option of dragging it out over a couple films or something. Yeah. I was okay with the way the team came together and uh, thank you, Miguel Cruz for the comment, by the way. Um, I was okay with the way the team came together because they all had their own reasons for fighting that particular fight. They ended up a team as a matter of circumstance, not because they decided they liked each other. Yeah. 
Like Jin was the one that really had to come to terms with, I'm going to fight for this instead of keep running. Yeah. Once she was on board, then, I mean, Cassian was already in, uh, K2, you know, says right there, I, I have to. Yeah. Right. Cause, Cause Cassian made me, uh, Baze and Chirrut were waiting for an excuse to join the fight. Basically, mm-hmm. especially after Jetta got blown up. They're like, all right, well, we got no reason not to now. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's like the, the empire just destroyed everything we believe in. I believe we're going to go fight them. Yeah. So they, they all had their own reasons and it was through fighting together that they bonded as a group. Yeah. And they didn't really bond as a group really come to men- come to think of it because they never really had to. They all had their own individual assignments in the in the final battle. Like, OK, we're going here. You guys are going here. You do this. You do that. It wasn't like they were like, oh, OK, I, I got your back, stranger. I just met. It's like, no, um, it's like, no, um, we're the ones that can infiltrate and do this because we have the skills to do that. Um, Baze and cheer it. You're going to go with the soldiers because you're warriors, you're warriors. Yeah. And Bodhi, you're the only one that knows how to fly or talk Imperial. So you're going to stay here with the ship. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. I could see that. So, yeah, they all, they all had their own role to ser- role to fill, and it didn't require a lot of teamwork amongst them. All they really had to do was just do it with the understanding that uh, there's a very low chance of survival. Yeah. No, that's true. That's true. And I, 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 like I said, I can I can see his point. But I, I mean, that that could be something as simple as, you know, you're you're tied down to the restrictions of how many minutes you can fit into a movie while pe- and people will people will tolerate sitting through it. Yeah, the first the first act of Rogue One does jump around a ton, but that's because you're assembling the crew. So it's like, yeah. okay, planet hop, planet hop, planet hop. And, it, and yeah, every time you're dropped to a new location, you have no idea why you're there. Yeah, it, but it picks up pretty quickly. It's pretty obvious because the camera pretty much immediately follows whoever you're supposed to be following. In yeah, that case, I, I have to admit, I, I didn't notice it to be jumping around a, a little bit. But then again, for me, being such a Star Wars nerd, I mean, I, I just I just was like, OK, this is you have to show me who's in the movie. So yeah. I, it's like, what am I, yeah, I going to do? It's always it's always a wild card. And it is the love of the fandom and how much we've spoken. <clears throat> we've spoken about it before where how much does your love of Star Wars blind some of the things that you watch in the movies? How How much are they willing or how much are you willing to let them get away with? Yeah, it's just it's, because how much you love the franchise. So. It's, it's always it, it's always like my argument for, you know, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I'm in a very small minority of people who love that movie because people love to pick it apart for this, that and the other. And my my take is Indiana Jones is my second favorite movie character ever. So if I got to see Indiana Jones kicking some more ass, that's fine with me. And all the other stuff he does is so outlandish. It's not like this is any different, you know. Meh. You know, and people go, oh, well, how could, you know, swing through the vines with the monkeys? It's like, well, he's Indiana Jones's kid. It's in his DNA. I don't know. It, it, it happened. It's cool. I, it's an interesting visual experience for me. So, yeah, maybe maybe my opinion is a little jaded from that outlook. But, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, it is very jaded. So we're just going to go with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Plus, I really don't want to get into Crystal Skull because I. Oh, we aren't. After after hearing you espouse that enough times, I went back on Amazon Prime since it's on there, and I, I'm sorry, I just don't see it the way you do, man. <laughs> I just can't love it. I keep watching. I've watched it three times since, trying, trying to see your point of view, and I just, I just can't see the refrigerator scene. Everybody hates it. I love it. I'm like, that's why he's Indiana freaking Jones, because he can survive a nuclear blast in a lead line fridge. But here's it's funny that they say that the Rogue One jumps around too much compared to, uh, you know, the cause and effect beat to beat of Revenge of the Sith. Because I actually feel kind of the opposite where like the convention that they broke of actually like giving you the title of the planet every time they jump. I'm like, OK, well, now I know where I am. Yeah. So it, it to me, it gave me a sense that um, the things that are going on in the galaxy really are going on all over the galaxy. So, yeah, it, it helped pull in the thought that this does affect everyone, not just the thing I'm seeing on the screen, which was cool. Yeah. And compare that to revenge of the Sith, where every time they go to a new location, there's a big drawn out scene of the ship, like making planet fall and landing. And yep. I'm like, well, where the hell are we now? Yeah. I hit, like, yeah, Uta Pau especially. I'm like, what the hell is this? Like, it's this planet I've never seen. He's going to this giant, stupid, big hole. Like what the hell yeah. is all this? I think meeting, talking to people that are apparently important and in charge that we've never met before who look like villains because they're, you know, they got the lined faces and they got the sharp teeth and they're all tall and spindly and they're wearing red on a green planet. Yeah. But they're 
apparently the oppressed race. Mm -hmm. Like there was a whole lot of that that I'm just like, I don't know what's going on right now. And it doesn't seem to fit. Yeah. I think I, I will, I'll give you that because I, I have to admit that giving the planet names in rogue one to me was, it almost made it like chapters in a book, which Mm -hmm. was, which was really cool. So it's like, you know, it's like, okay, well there's a big four at the top of the page. So, you know, you're starting something different. Like it was to me, that was cool. It, It, it clearly delineated a different situation, you know, a different location. I thought, I thought that was cool. So yeah, I it's did not like, like they were going back and forth, you know, making yourself confused at what you were watching or anything like yeah, that. Right? So, so yeah, that makes sense. I never yeah. thought of it that way, but I'll probably look at it that way now next time I yeah. watch it. I mean, I mean, if you're, if you're going to throw like six planets into the first like 25 minutes of the movie, it's almost a necessity. Yeah. Cause you're like, what the hell is this? Now, what do you think about the point, um, that, and I might botch this name. I'm sorry. Uh, Aaron Bissonio brings up saying that uh, the lightsaber duel is right there. You can just like give the title to revenge of the Sith because I mean the Obi-Wan Anakin lightsaber duel, I guess technically the Obi-Wan Vader duel um, is Uh, just, it's so great that it instantly makes that movie like all win. I think that goes, I think that goes back to what I said five minutes ago. That sounds like the, the blind love of star Wars. There's so many people that go "Eh, lightsabers. So that one's better. Yeah. And people are entitled to that. And I know a lot of people that actually think that, that, you know, rogue one is not on the top of their list because they, they look at, well, I want lightsaber duels and I want this and this, and it didn't feel well, like it's, Star Wars compared to the rest of them. So, I mean, I can can see where somebody's coming from on that, at least. Well, I, let, let's let's draw the parallel then. Let's compare the long awaited Vader Obi-Wan duel in Revenge of the Sith to the what did you hit? Nothing. That was neither of mine. <laughs> what happened? It wasn't mine. Oh, well, anyway. Um, it better not be yours. Are we still recording? Yeah, <laughs> yes, we're still recording. Both, both of my computers are muted right now. So, but so you you take that you take that lightsaber duel versus the scene aboard the Tantive Four with Vader in the hallway, and which is also something people have been waiting for you know decades to see is Vader just like shredding rebels. So, which do you think was the more gratifying payoff? Well, you didn't know that the that the scene in Rogue One was coming. Unless you're like one of one of the fans like us, where we followed, you yeah, know, the making of like, and you had heard yeah. rumblings of it. That was just at the end, like, holy crap, what is this? You know, I that still, was. I still say that scene needed another like three minutes. Oh yeah, though. right. <laughs> where, where is the where is the Anakin Obi Wan fight? You already knew. Again, I I think I think uh, that person makes a very good point because. In a way, it's a it's a smaller version of my main point about the movie in that, you know, the ending and it got there in a really good, satisfying way to me, because, you know, Obi-Wan's going to win that fight and that Anakin's going to turn into a crispy critter with multiple, you know, his legs and one arm cut off or whatever the heck it was. And but the fight itself was still really kick ass. They didn't they didn't just have it be a quick thing to where you're like, well, I waited for that. I mean, they, they drew it out. Each guy had a, you know, had a, had a up, had the upper hand at some point. They, they had an awesome backdrop to it. There was a lot of cool Jedi stuff. And I mean, it was, it was really cool to see that. And they, you know, they said, well, you've heard about this for years. So here's your payoff. And it was cool. So to me, it's, you know, it's like a little microcosm of my point about the movie in general. So I could see that. I could say, I mean, whether or not. Okay. So this kind of brings it right back to the main point. Then like you're taking individual scenes and saying, I enjoyed that scene and I expected all of these scenes. So the fact that all the parts were satisfying meant that the entire movie was satisfying. Okay. And it seems like the the contrary opinion is that rogue one had events that needed to take place, but the the individual components that made up that storyline were more unique or are more unexpected. Okay. But I, again, that, that probably goes to the original point that it had a blank canvas, whereas episode three did not, you know, I mean, you knew, you knew that at the end of episode three, Anakin had to turn into Darth Vader and end up in the suit. At the very least, he had to be chopped up. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's not a lot of gray area there. You got to have him, you got to show him getting his ass kicked, but 
are they going to do it to where, I mean, you, you just showed the guy besting a Sith Lord who's supposed to be like the second most powerful Sith in the galaxy earlier in the movie, but then you're going to have Obi-Wan Kenobi, like knock him out in like 45 seconds. It, it, it's, it's, you can't do that. So you had to have it be a much more drawn out, bigger fight. So you already know that's what you're getting, but it was still really, really cool. I mean, I, okay. I, I think that's my point. Well, I hope it is. You said it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I just, you know, it, it comes back to my original point. The episode three had so much less to work with. So it was a much more difficult task to make it a good movie. Whereas Rogue One could just do all this crazy stuff. And, you know, I mean, and I mean, that that said, I'm not saying that Rogue One was so much easier because when you have something that bumps up against episode four, the movie that started it all. And you, 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 that means you have to have it look like episode four. People are yeah. inst- instantly going, people all, instantly are going to go, well, th- this has to be as good as episode four then. So, so you've got that stigma on its back. Whereas episode three, people were like, well, episode one and two are crap. So, you know, this has got to be better because it's going to, we're going to see Darth Vader and we're going to see Anakin and Obi-Wan fight. And, you know, so that it was in that respect, it was easier than rogue one, mm-hmm. but you know, so Rogue One did have a lot of weight on it, and it was, I mean, and hell, in its defense as well, it was the very first non-saga film that they made, which is, I mean, that that is a huge risk, because I know when I first, I mean, when I saw the very first teaser trailer for it, I was like, yeah, I'm like, that. I don't know. So I was like, whatever. And then as it got closer and closer to the movie, I was pumped up, but I was much more excited to see episode seven. And I, you know, Rogue One, I was excited because it was a Star Wars movie, but I was way more excited to see Episode Seven. And hmm. and yet, my reaction to the films were opposite. Maybe that's well, maybe that's part of it too, right there. Is the the uh, expectations going into it? Because Revenge of the Sith had the entire saga riding on it, and Rogue One was like, well, if it sucks, who cares? It's not part of the main storyline anyway. Yeah. So that one, you can just go into it not really caring if it's that awesome or not, which means you're you're able to exceed expectations. Where with Revenge of the Sith, tons of expectations going into that. Like yeah, like you always say, the prequels could never measure up to the original trilogy because you cannot expect that kind of lightning in a bottle twice. Yep, you never you can never get that kind of thrill when it's not the first time. Yeah, and I think that's kind of true to a point because Rogue One was the first time we'd seen those characters or events play out. So you had that that newness to it. Yeah. Whereas Revenge of the Sith, you're like, well, we've been to this universe so many times. We know exactly the, where everything lays out, how these characters behave. How are we going to put them in situations that aren't predictable? Simple answer is you really can't. Yeah. And, I it, and you know, one of the things that I love about both movies, and that's why we started this topic, is that. It's just, I left the theater with, for both of them having just, again, I knew where it was going to end, but I left going, Oh my God, was that kick ass? You know? Cause I mean, there's a lot of movies where if you go in there, you know, what's going to happen and you're just, it's easy to be let down Mm -hmm. if you know the ending, you know, I can't just, you know, spur of the moment off the top of my head. I can't think of one, but it's so easy to just do it poorly. Prometheus. (laughs) Well, I don't I don't know if you knew the ending of that one. It's, it was the first of four movies. So and that's the alien thing is totally different because I've seen alien uh, uh, covenant and the alien movies are just following the exact same pattern. I mean, I love them because they're very creepy and there's awesome gore, but it's just they're starting to follow the same damn pattern. I'm like, the movie's over. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, there's still another half hour to go. The alien got back on the ship. Son of a bitch. <laughs> like, <laughs> So, yeah, the first escape is never the final escape. Yeah, never. Yeah. So are there any are there any more good points on there? Uh, Well, there's there's the uh, the contention of the. uh, Let's see, we got. Too many conversations in CG hallways for Revenge of the Sith. I I discredit that because that was the, the movie making style that that was that's just. I have the technology I'm using. Of the it, which, times. Yeah, yeah. that's... I, I, I mean, there was tons of CG in Rogue One as well. I mean, you got K2SO, an entirely digital character. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they do go on to say that the uh, Rogue One bounced around to a variety of interesting settings. Basically, he's saying like the, the Jedi Temple and all that. It was 
the sets were very bland in Revenge of the Sith. A lot of it was just wow, interesting, kind of not memorable. Wow, okay. Either, I, either I was there weren't new locations, or because the the locations themselves weren't designed interestingly. I'm not sure, but he doesn't like the uh, he doesn't like all the conversations and the settings that a lot of the major plot points took place in. Okay, I would actually argue the opposite, but you know. I could see that, I guess. Well, except for Mustafar, most of the major plot points take place in already established settings. So if you're, you know, if you don't like the way Coruscant looks or the pal- uh, <laughs> yeah, chancellor's, true. chancellor's office or something, well, then I guess you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. Um, Rogue One bounces around a variety of interesting settings, spending just enough time on each and has better pacing overall. Now, the pacing, that's a hard one because I haven't yeah. seen Revenge of the Sith in a while. Um, i I love the pacing of Rogue One. It's fresher in the mind, so I can remember it better. Um, I don't know. What do you think about the pacing of Revenge of the Sith? Again, we said there's so much stuff to cover in in only two hours and change. That one, that one's tough. I would have to go back and really think about that point because Episode Three starts out with a 25 minute enormous space battle right off the bat. So you've got this huge set piece, and Rogue One has a couple minutes of you know establishing Jyn Erso as a kid. And then it's, you know, however many minutes of just finding all the characters and sticking them together. So it's two very different ways of getting into the meat of the movie. Yeah, you almost had to sit down and watch them with the sole purpose of comparing the two. Which yeah. honestly, I've never sat down in. And like you said, AJ, it's been a while since I've watched episode three. But to even if I sat down and watched it tonight. uh that you almost have to go into it with a flat out comparison of the two. So you can try to beat the two of them. Yeah. I mean, like I've never sat down and just watched them and went, okay, how is this going to lead into rogue one right now? So it's, it's tough to sit there and try to compare scene to scene for jumps and things like that. Cause it's, I've, I've also, I've also never had, a moment in any of the any of the eight movies where I've gone, boy, this is taking a bit, you know. I mean, it, it, I, right. it, it's ne- it's never moved slowly for me because there's always cuts to here and there, so it's never. So I mean, yeah, even with all the complaints of episode two and all the 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 political stuff, I never actually sat there with a an attitude of wow, this is really taking yeah. forever to get through this because it's interspersed with Obi Wan's little spy mission and yeah. stuff like that, and then. You know, all that. And then it moves to, you know, Geonosis and all that. Yeah, stuff. If they so, gave yeah. you 45 minutes of Senate talk or something. Yeah. It, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it all of a sudden becomes Lincoln. Yeah. Where it's nothing but dialogue for like, <laughs> like oh, my God. Yeah, the, the two bits, I think, could have been could have been cut shorter. And this is just George being George. Um, the pod race in episode one did not need to be that long. Like they he's lengthened it over the years. It, it was shorter in the original theatrical version. He didn't, well, we've already they, disagreed about that. I, I think it's awesome. They added seven minutes, seven whole minutes of pod racing, not in the final cut. Well, there's a lot of it, but so, so there's one. And I think, I think the rescue of Palpatine could have gone faster to start off episode three. Like they, they didn't really have a lot of the space battle. They showed a little bit of it, but I mean, most of it was spent inside the ship then fighting Grievous and then landing the ship. And that it, it didn't really influence the plot because the three people that were on board the ship crashing to Coruscant all had to survive. So there wasn't well, really a lot of drama there. I was like, well, to play devil's advocate though, if you're going to get on the, the main starship of the bad guys, you don't want them to get in and out in like a minute. And that because then you're going to go, well, what the hell they need Anakin and Obi-Wan for? If, if two Jedi could just get in and out that easy, just go send some of those other schlubs. Why are they risking their best guys? So they had to make it kind of, well, this is a very difficult place to get in and out of, I think. Well, if they had focused on the battles with Grievous and Dooku and not so much on we're in an elevator shaft now. Oh, wait, the shaft is now a slide. Uh, oh, that know, OK, all, that'll give you. Okay. Yeah, there was a lot of like goofy action pieces that were there for the kids. And yeah. yes, these are kids movies, but. When you've when you've only got like we said when you've got two hours and change to tell all this story you've got to be really judicious with your cuts and figure yeah. out where do you want to spend your time and I don't think landing the crashed ship was really the best use of that time. Well, then let me ask you a question before before we close up. Do you think that that was an aesthetic choice by George Lucas because he knew the rest of the movie was in such dark 
territory that he put that stuff in there. So the whole thing wasn't Indiana Jones and the temple of doom where the whole movie, you're just like, Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Like, could be. This is, this is black all the way through. I mean, they had, they had to have the fun part to kind of offset. And he said he wanted to show the brotherhood that had evolved between the two and, yeah. and show the sort of adventures that they'd gone on on a regular basis to build that rapport. So this yeah. was like that one last shot or in our, in the audience's case, the first shot of those two having an adventure as friends yeah, to show that the dynamic had shifted from like fatherly mentor to, to student slash son. Yeah. To, like teammates. You know, almost. Yeah. 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 Very, yeah. But cool. Steve, you brought up an interesting point. It's not one that we can get to tonight, but I don't even know if I want to do this at any point, but I wonder what episode three would have been like if they had known that rogue one was going to exist. Like oh, how, man. how would episode three be different knowing that there was another movie to bolt between the trilogies? Wow. That now that's interesting. Food yeah, for now, thought for next time. I think Yeah, I think it's, now you're in the world of fanfic right there. So yeah, that's, that's a good hypothetical. We could, we could hit on that on another show, but, uh, We've already we've already talked a bunch on this tonight, so why don't we close up shop at that point? Uh, excellent find on on the way way to go on the Facebook stuff, AJ, to put it out there and get some opinions. That was really cool. Yeah, so, got to thank our fellow podcasters for that. Yeah, thanks everybody for uh, contributing to uh, your opinions. It helped us speed this along. It was very cool. It was it was nice to get some outside perspective. Uh, great conversation, guys. This was this was a fun one. It flew by. Yeah. So uh, thanks everyone again uh, for listening. Uh, you can find us at. Uh, nerfherdercouncil.com we have our voicemail line as I stutter we have our voicemail line which is 440-987-WARS uh, 9277 call and leave us a message let us know what you think of the show if you want to hear us talk about something just throw in your two cents we'll play you on the air uh, you can find us on Spreaker Stitcher Google Play iTunes all those other nice podcasting places we've got our Facebook page go shoot us a like uh, post stuff interact with us we always we always love talking to everybody and you know having fun interacting with the fans and listeners and all that stuff uh we stickers. have our some t-shirts upon request yes we do have stickers and t-shirts upon request you can you know get some nhc swag it's always good it's actually a really cool t-shirt i want to say that again it is a really cool shirt thank you so you did an excellent job we need more of those once we save up some money so but uh we have our twitter page which we are pretty active on it's uh at NHC podcast. So uh, thanks again for checking out another episode of the Nerf Herder Council. We'll catch you next time. I am your host, JT at Dog Pound Jedi. He is AJ at Winning Trivia all the time. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> at Drake Adams 579. He is Steve at JSteve1005. And we will catch you next time, which I already said once, but I said it again. Oops. We're on fire. You're one groovy baby. Baby. <laughs> <laughs>